Join me in prayer, if you will, please. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I welcome everything that comes to me today because I know it is for my healing. I welcome all thoughts, feelings, emotions, persons, situations, and conditions. I let go of my desire for power and control. I let go of my desire for affection, esteem, approval, and pleasure. I let go of my desire for survival and security. I let go of my desire to change any situation, condition, person, or myself. I open to the love and presence of God and God's action within. And all the people said, Amen. I want to um, ask for uh, prayers this morning I, um, for the family of Sandra Harris. Sandra was our, um, she was our COO and, and vice president and was a, a nurse at Arlington Memorial while I was there, and she passed yesterday uh, on our hospice unit. And so you just keep them in your prayers this week. I want to send a shout out to Julie and Tracy Maxwell. Uh, Tracy's recovering well at home, I'm sure. Thanks a lot to the love and the, the good care that he gets from Julie, who's now learned to be a nurse, uh, as well as her other full-time job. And so we'll be grateful um, to have them back with us soon. And then Diana and Danny Eads have asked for a special prayer today. Uh, you know, Diana and Danny have kind of become uh, the the caretakers, sort of, they're helping Diana's sister and brother-in-law as they navigate um, uh, through changing their whole lives. They've moved them here from Van Horn, and so Danny and Diana have, have been helping them get settled in. Anyway, Diana's brother-in-law um, ended up in the emergency room last night, and Diana and Danny were with him, and he tested positive for COVID, and so pray for him. Uh, pray for them. They're going to quarantine for a few days. And so um, just know, I know you're watching guys. And so we love you and we miss you and we're grateful for you. And I have to get a drink of water because sinus medicine doesn't know just to dry up your sinuses. All right. So uh, back in October, I preached. On September and October, I preached a series of sermons. Uh, from a book called Breathing Underwater by Father Richard Rohr. You remember that book? It's, um, it's based on the 12-step step program from Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Father Rohr, those kind of reshaped things so that it is told from a more mindful, a more compl con contemplative, a more spiritual theme. And so along with that, he has added... Um, Examples from the life of Christ as told in the, in the Gospels, and then also from his own life. And so this, uh, th this is going to be a continuation of that sermon series. And w one way or the other, for as long as it takes, we're going to get through these 12 steps together, all right? I'm, uh, I'm trying to work them as I'm preaching about them. And so some of them I can get through in a week. Some of them... Take some. They take, take a while. So, uh, so we're just going to do a real quick review. Step one was, I am powerless over my addiction and my life is unmanageable. Now, when I was uh, preparing for the sermon and looking back at it, I noticed a lot of these steps have two parts. So this one has two parts. One A says that I've admitted that I have no power over my addic my addiction. Now, I know some of you are probably sitting here saying. Why, what? Why are we talking about this again? I don't have any addictions. I know some of you are probably feeling that way. And you know, you, you're probably right. You might not have an addiction to any drugs or alcohol or any other harmful service. But folks, I've seen you at the potluck. Right? Me first. And there's, there's quite a few of us in here that, you know, we calm ourselves and we soothe ourselves with food. And if it's macaroni and cheese and Vita's coconut cream pie, 
you need to just get out of my way. Because I've got some numbing to do. I need to heal some of this trauma in my life with some of that comfort food. And so you may not have an addiction that Alcoholics Anonymous had in mind, but we all are addicted to something. And so then the second part of 1A is one, the second part of step one is 1B, is admitting that our life is out of control. Now your life can be out of control whether you have an addiction or not. And so step one is really a two-part step. Step two, I've come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore my life to sanity. Now, I believe that sentence is too long. I do. I, that's another two-parter. I think that really what it ought to say is, I have come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore my life. Period. Because sanity is kind of a, it's an individual kind of thing, right? What some people think is sane, other people are shaking their heads at. And so sanity to me is something that is very individual. But God can restore all our lives to a place of peace. Step three, I've made a decision to turn my life and my will over to God as I understand God. Step 3a, another two-parter. Richard Rohr says, it's the will itself. It's our stubborn and self-defeating willfulness that must be first converted and handed over. Folks, we got to give God the keys to the car. And not just the keys to the car, but we've got to get in the car and sit in the seat and put on our seat belts and just be quiet and let God take us where God's going to take us. And know that God's already been wherever it is that we're traveling to. And rest in the peace of that. And so, I wish surrender was that easy. I wish I could just reach in my pocket and say, oh, all right, here you go, Lord. I'm going to let you drive. Not just for a minute, but for all things. I'm going to let you drive. But it's not that easy, right? Because what did Roar say? Our stubborn and self-defeating willfulness always jumps up in the way, doesn't it? So 3B then, if 3A is that we've, we're going to surrender, we're going to turn our life over to God as we understand God. What we're doing right there is we're admitting that God will help shape our recovery from whatever it is. Now you and I worship the same God, but we don't all have the same understanding of God. We share many of the same beliefs about God. But my experience with God is different than your experience with God. God has shown up in my life differently than God has shown up in your life. And so though we all gather here on a Sunday morning and call ourselves United Methodists, we don't all have exactly the same understanding of God. And if we don't have the same understanding of God, Imagine those folks who don't practice our same faith traditions. The folks who are not Christian. The folks who are not Muslim or are not Buddhist. The folks who don't believe in anything at all as a higher power. We've got to, I believe, make a space for folks like that who don't necessarily believe the way we believe. How else will they know that God loves them if they're never invited to the place where God's love exists. And so we've got to make space for that. Step four, I will make a fearless and searching moral inventory of my life. Ooh, I hated this step. Aurora said to us in this book that uh, the purpose of the inventory was for the sake of truth and humility and generosity of spirit. The instructions were to sit down and make a list of the wrong things in your life. And you had to be honest. You had to tell the absolute truth. And you had to put it on paper. And I encouraged you, don't just do the wrong things in your life. Do the good things in your life too. 
Make a list of the things you're grateful for, that you're thankful for, that you like about yourself. Make a list of your own strengths. I didn't want us to just stop at the wrongs in our lives. But you know, it's not so much about making that list. It's about the struggle. It's about our intense desire to be completely open and honest and truthful about things. And it's also then about what you decide to do with those things once you've put them on a list. Are you going to keep behaving that way? Are you going to keep living with those wrongs in your life? Or are you going to look at this list of right things and keep doing the right things in your life? Sometimes all I can do in my life is the next right thing. I can't even think about getting through the whole day being nice. I'm just trying to figure out how to be nice to the human being in front of me. And when I mess up, you know, just making this list is not it. You've got to forgive yourself for the things that are on this list. The point of making the list is to begin to bring to the front of your mind the places that you don't ever want to go back to and to put in front of your life the things that you want to dwell in. Because, you know, if you don't learn to forgive yourself for the things, you're going to have to start a whole new list about why you couldn't forgive yourself for the things that you should have been forgiving yourself for. It's really complicated. Step four was hard for me. And uh, it's been so hard for me that I've been working on it almost constantly since October 1st, which is when I preached the first sermon about it. Because you know what? It's truly difficult for us to look in the mirror and admit things to ourselves that we know are true, but we don't want to think about. We don't want to say out loud. And so, man, I really, when I went through step four, Max, I thought, man, this is too hard. I can't do this. And then I read step five. Step five says, I admitted to God to myself, and to another human being, the exact nature of my wrongs. Somebody said, ouch, (laughs) ouch. Yeah, right? I mean, it was hard enough for me to make that list. And now I have to confess it to God, right? Weren't you there when I did those things wrong? I have to say them out loud to God. I have to confess to myself. All of those things, I was there when it happened. I don't want to relive that mess either. And then on top of that, I have to tell somebody else? Ooh, Lord, I didn't sign up for that. I didn't sign up for that part. But here's what Father Rohr says about confession, about admitting or confessing to God and to yourself and to another human being the wrongs about your nature. Rohr says that you cannot heal what you do not acknowledge. He goes on to say that what you do not consciously acknowledge will remain in control of you from within, festering and destroying you and those around you. The Apostle Thomas records in quote 70, Jesus said this, If you bring forth that which is within you, it will save you. If you do not bring it forth, it will destroy you. Step step five, folks, it's about healing and restoration. Step five lays out a clear structure of accountability for us for knowing, for speaking, and for hearing the full truth. Step five is actually the second part of step four. In step five, we take that list and we take responsibility 
for the wrong things that we've done, for the wrong things about our nature. We take responsibility for it. And we speak those things out loud to ourselves. And we admit to ourselves, yeah, I did that. And then we say to God, I did this. Forgive me. And we say it to someone else who we know is ready to hear those things about us. And then we have to be quiet and we have to listen for the full truth of God to come into our lives and be revealed. Now, I'm going to recommend something to you here as soon as I can move my tongue again. I'm going to recommend that you do not share your list of wrongs with just anyone. Okay? I'm not asking you to turn this into the Jerry Springer show. Okay? That's not what it's about. What it's about is finding someone trustworthy. Someone who's going to listen to you without trying to fix you. Someone who's going to listen without judgment or condemnation. Someone who lives with compassion. You know, I talked to you a few weeks ago about compassion being that place where love meets suffering and remains loving. Compassion's a hard thing. We're going to have a whole sermon series on compassion. But, but the person that you want to tell the truth to about yourself, and I'm talking about the whole truth and nothing but the truth, that person needs to be ready for it. This passage that we read in our responsive reading today from Proverbs, it says, Iron sharpens iron. Now, I used to work with a group of nurses, and we use that phrase with each other all the time because when we were working together, we wanted to make our program the very best it could be. And so sometimes that meant sitting in a room at a table and telling each other some hard things. We had to look at each other and we had to, to break through all the baggage that each other, that we were each carrying. We had to, sh- we had to, to just move away everything from us, our egos. We had to suspend our, our, whatever we thought was our superior knowledge of the subject. And we had to get down to the core of what is the very best thing that we could do. And sometimes these things we said to each other, they were hard. They were very difficult. But you know what? We were committed to be the best. We were going to be iron sharpens iron. We were going to be better because we came up against something hard in our lives. Something that told us the truth and demanded the truth from us. So the person you confess to, be prepared. Because they don't just have to be committed to you being the best you can be. You also have to be committed to being the best you can be. Roar describes that person as someone willing and prepared to sit on the mercy seat in your life. He gave this person a name. Actually, it's based on a Celtic concept of something called a soul friend. And it's called Anamkara. And it's this concept in ancient Celtic belief, this spiritual concept that you have a friend who knows your soul, who knows everything about you, who has no judgment or condemnation for you, who only loves you and has compassion for you. This Anamkara, this friend that you can say anything to and that will always tell you the truth about yourself. And so part of step five is finding that friend and talking to them about whatever that list said on step four. Because remember, if you don't acknowledge it, you probably cannot heal from it. 
And I believe that Jesus knows that we need that kind of a person in our lives. I think Jesus had that kind of a person in his life. I don't think Jesus had any wrong in his nature. But I believe that there had to be somebody there to hear about his heartaches and his disappointments. And I say that to you because in John, in John 15, Jesus says to us, my command is this, that you love each other the way I've loved you. Because greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends, or her life for her friends, or their life for their friends. Jesus knows we need a soul friend in our lives. He knows we need someone who will temporarily put their own life to the side and help you focus on yours. Jesus knows that part of our healing is to speak out loud to another human being the things that we wish were not true about ourselves and then to receive from that human being nothing but love. And what Roar says is when you come face to face with another human being who looks at you and just loves you, no matter what you've said to them, that you have come face to face with God. And so, step four was hard. It was hard to write down those things. Step five is not going to be easy. But the whole purpose of this is not about moral purity, folks. It's about moral maturity. And I've shared with you that my desire is to be a mature Christian. To be spiritually mature. I don't want to just have a foundation in my belief. I want to understand it to the core of my being. I don't deserve to be here or here or wearing this robe if I'm not on that journey towards spiritual maturity. And I'm not preaching it to you because I think you're all spiritually immature. I'm not. But I'm telling you, it's changing my life. And it's bringing me closer to God. And I want you to have that same thing. I want you to experience that same thing. Now, step five, it's going to be hard. I'm going to warn you, it's hard. Be careful who you pick for your Anamkara. Make sure they're willing and ready and prepared for it. I mean, I'm almost afraid to look at step six. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. If I have to do this for five, I'm not even sure what, what what's going to be asked of me in step six. And if, am I going to be able to get all the way to 12? Who, who knows? More to come. But I do know. I'm committed to being a better human tomorrow and for the rest of today than I was when I got up this morning. I'm committed to forgiving myself when I mess that up and to always trying to do better. And I am committed, as I know you are, to growing in grace and in truth. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we bring our lives to you, Lord. You already know the wrong things in our nature that have happened. You already know the great things that we do and who we are, God, but when we speak them out loud to You, Lord, we take accountability for what we've done. And God, we're grateful that You've given us a way to do that. We're grateful that You hear our prayers and that You listen to us. And mostly, God, that You love us in spite of ourselves. And so, God, as we leave this place today, Lord, help us to keep our minds on You. And even if we're not making lists and we're not confessing things out loud, Lord, help us to be committed to grow in grace and truth. God, be with those folks who aren't with us today. Let them know that they are loved and that they are missed. 
Keep us safe this week as we are away from each other. And bring us back here next week safely. And we love you and we are grateful for the cross. And it's in the name of the risen Christ that we pray. Amen.